Hey there, everybody. It is Nurse Mo, and welcome back to the Straight A Nursing Podcast. Today is episode 73, and we're talking about ventricular septal defects. So this is a pediatric focused topic. I think I mentioned to you guys a few weeks back that we're starting to do a more well-rounded library of topics for you. And I realized I hadn't really been talking about peds or women's health or mental health. So that has changed and you will notice a lot more regularity with these types of topics. So our last pediatrics topic was atrial septal defects. You'll see a lot of similarities here between atrial septal defects and ventricular septal defects. So I wanted to add a little extra and talk a little bit more in this one about some of the severe complications that can occur with septal defects and give you guys just a good overview. Between those two episodes, you should have a pretty good grasp of what goes on when the little ones have these septal defects. But before we get into that, it is time for our listener shout out. So today's listener shout out, I can't pronounce her name because it's just letters and numbers. It is ABMR3, and she is sending us a Apple podcast review from the United States. And I really like this review because she provides a study tip for fellow students. And her review says, great for studying. I'm currently a nursing student about to start clinicals, but in an accelerated master's program, and these podcasts have been so helpful. Study tip. Take notes on your professor's lecture, find an episode on a relevant topic when it's possible, then go back through your notes and integrate the two together. It's helped me immensely. I want to say that is great advice. And thank you, ABMR3, for sharing it and for rating and reviewing the podcast. You have made my day. Thank you so much. So if you're interested in being a possible listener shout out, go to wherever you get your podcast fix, rate and review, and maybe I'll say hi to you on the next episode. So let's get back into our topic, ventricular septal Defects. So a few weeks back, you guys all learned about atrial septal defects. So now it's time to look at how this same anomaly affects physiology when it occurs in the ventricles. So you may hear this called a VSD, and that's just a lot faster to say than ventricular septal defect. And what a VSD is, it's an abnormal opening between the right and the left ventricle. So just like those ASDs, those atrial ones, it can vary in size. So it can be small and sometimes close on its own in that first year of life or so. Maybe it can last longer, but it's so small that it doesn't cause the patient a lot of problems. If it's a bit on the larger side and starts causing significant problems for our patients, that's when we see abnormalities in physiology. These defects can actually be so large that it is essentially as though the patient has one ventricle. So when that occurs, the the pathophysiology can be a little bit more pronounced with an ASD, and it's definitely going to cause significant problems for little baby. So the other thing I want you to know about septal defects is that when they occur, It's often in coordination with other defects. So taking care of these patients can be very, very challenging because they may just have a lot of heart problems overall or other defects in general. So let's talk a little bit about how a VSD affects the little guy's physiology. So again, just like we do with atrial septal defects, we're going to think about how the blood throws flows through the heart and the lungs. If you've got that pathway down very solid, you'll be able to think through how problems affecting the heart really do cause um, alterations in physiology and really understand why they cause it. So let's take a look at that blood flow, shall we? So deoxygenated blood comes into that right atrium from the superior or the inferior vena cava. Then the blood flows from the right atrium to the right ventricle, and then the right ventricle 
pumps the blood into the pulmonary vasculature so that it can participate in gas exchange. And now the blood is oxygenated. It's going to enter the left atrium, flow into the left ventricle, and then get pumped out into systemic circulation to deliver oxygen to the body. So when you're thinking about that blood flow and that pathway, I want you to think about the pressures in the heart. So the right ventricle, where is that pumping blood to? It's pumping blood into the lungs, which really aren't that big and they're right there. But the left ventricle is pumping blood all the way through the entire systemic circulation. So when we're looking at pressures in the heart, right pressure versus left pressure, that left pressure side is going to be the higher pressure side. So now let's imagine that there's a good sized hole in the wall between those two ventricles, the left ventricle with the higher pressure and the right ventricle with that lower pressure. So which direction is that blood going to flow? It's going to go from the higher pressure side, which is the left side, into the right side just because of the pressure gradient that you guys learned about in your physiology class. So just like with the ASDs, this is going to cause increased blood flow to the lungs. And while that might sound good, like, great, let's give the lungs all the blood. Actually, it's not great. It can eventually lead to increased pulmonary vascular resistance and pulmonary congestion and pulmonary edema. The right ventricle now, it's got all that extra pressure in it, and the heart doesn't like this. It likes things to be normalized. So when the right ventricle is having to deal with more pressure than what it was constructed for, it's going to get hypertrophy, meaning it's going to get enlarged. And anytime the heart is enlarged, it doesn't work as efficiently or effectively. So this is also going to compound our patient's problems. So some signs of a ventricular septal defect in the little ones, pretty much the same as with the atrial septal defects. If the baby's tiring with feeding, has failure to thrive, not gaining weight, is breathing faster than a little baby should, is is getting really tired in general, maybe have a murmur, all signs that the baby could be having a VSD or an ASD. So a lot of times, like I said, if the defect is small and it's not really causing baby any trouble, they may wait and see if it closes on their own. But if it is in that category, one that is causing derangements in physiology or is of a size that's not likely to close on its own, then it's going to get treated. So... Basically, that is surgery, and I think the general guidelines that I found said that they like to do this in that first year of age, though it can occur at any time. Like maybe one was, it was asymptomatic when they were younger, and now that the baby's older, it starts causing problems, and they need to fix it. They're still going to fix it, but if they can get it done early, they're going to get it done early. Also, baby could get medications to reduce the impact that those symptoms have on the system. So with all that extra blood volume going into the lungs, baby may get diuretics to decrease volume. It's going to help get that fluid off the lungs so they may not have as much pulmonary congestion and pulmonary edema. They may get medications to keep their heartbeat regular as that could be affected. And common ones used are digoxin and metoprolol. So let's talk a little bit about some of the complications of a VSD. So we talked about pulmonary congestion just a moment ago. Both a VSD and an ASD can cause pulmonary hypertension, which is probably one of the most common complications that you'll see. It's very serious long-term condition. Pulmonary hypertension is essentially high blood pressure in those 
arteries of the lungs. And what this does is it increases pulmonary pressure, making it really difficult for blood to flow through the lungs, which makes the right side of the heart work harder. And again, that right side of the heart may be hypertrophied, may not be working very effectively. So you can see how these problems kind of compound on one another. Eventually, that right heart will weaken to the point where the patient goes into right heart failure. So that's not good either. So an additional complication of these septal defects is called Eisenmenger syndrome. And this occurs when that increased pressure in the lungs becomes so severe, so great that the direction of blood flow changes. You heard that right. So right now with Before we get into Eisenmenger syndrome, we've got blood flowing abnormally from the left side to the right side of the heart following that pressure gradient. That's considered a left to right shunt. With Eisenmenger syndrome, it's going to reverse. So we'll get a right to left shunt. And if you're unsure and you're not really clear on what shunting is, it's okay. Don't stress about that right now. I do have a blog post about VQ mismatch. So if you're interested in learning more about shunting, I don't know that I've made a podcast episode about it yet, but if you go to the straightynursestudent.com website, go to the search bar, put in mismatch, and it should come up and you can read about shunting. It's very interesting. So in this case of Eisenmenger syndrome, We've got a right to left shunt. So I want you to think about a little bit of the implications of what that could be for the patient. So if the blood is being shunted from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart, what do you think that could possibly mean for the patient? What's different about blood in the right ventricle versus blood in the left ventricle? The blood in the right ventricle is oxygen poor. It has not traveled to the lungs yet to participate in gas exchange. So if we've got blood on the right ventricle shunting over to the left ventricle and getting pushed out into systemic circulation, we're looking at systemic hypoxia. We've got blood out there in circulation that has not participated in gas exchange. So this happens enough and for long enough, eventually we've got severe global hypoxia and it can be fatal. So Eisenmenger syndrome, very serious complication of these defects. Another complication not as common Um, as the pulmonary hypertension, but still possible is endocarditis, which is basically infections in the heart and valve problems. So over time, if this defect is not repaired, it's going to increase the patient's risk for a bunch of other problems like heart failure, that pulmonary hypertension, um, irregular heart rate, even stroke can happen. So this was a short episode I just wanted to give you guys a quick overview of ventricular septal defects so that it would correlate with the atrial septal defects episode that we just did. And if there's other topics in PEDS that you are very excited to learn about, please send an email to straightanursingstudent.com. Uh, there's a contact link there, or you can go to um, just email and go to hello at straightanursingstudent.com. I will get that as well. So for the past couple of weeks, I've been making announcement that the planners are live in the Etsy shop and the covers are Oh my gosh, you guys are going to love them. For those of you that really loved the heart one from last time, I've got an even better one for this time. It's edgy and beautiful and cool and you're going to love it. Um, There's one that's kind of retro and and a little little funny. Um, There's one that's like a geometric pattern, I believe. 
There's just some really cool covers. I'm really excited about them. Um, and for those of you that are worried about the fact that we're not printing them and shipping them to you right now, I want to read you a couple of reviews from the Etsy shop for people that got their planner as a PDF and absolutely loved it. So Maddie says, love it. I got the PDF and had it printed out and bound like a notebook. I am so happy with it. I just started my first semester in nursing school and it's been a lifesaver. It's so nice to be able to check things off that you've completed. Maddie, I absolutely agree. I love a good checklist and I love marking things off my checklist. If you're like me, do you write things down after you've done them just so you can check them off? I bet you do. I bet a lot of you do that. Um, let's see. Monica says perfect and the printing instructions were super easy to follow. Let's see here. N. Duran says love, love, love. Gotta love that, short and sweet. Dwight and Leslie say that it is well thought out and beautiful. Let's see if I can get one more here. Sometimes people just leave uh, stars, so they don't say anything. Lots of five stars happening here. I have to go to another page. Lots of five stars. I love this planner. It is so versatile, versatile and helps to keep me organized. Yeah, so those are just, um, oh, here we go. This planner is freaking amazing, says Heather. I don't know how I was able to get through last semester without it. I got the PDF version and the printing instructions were straightforward and so easy. So there you go. If you were nervous about it, don't be. People love it. And it really will help you be super organized for nursing school. So next week on the podcast, we are going to be talking about study groups. And before you think I am gung-ho, big fan of study groups, I will tell you right now, the title of the episode is Why Study Groups Are a Waste of Time. Now, if you are a study group fan, don't worry. I'm going to give you some tips so that they aren't. So check back in next week to learn why your study group might be a huge waste of time and how to fix it. See you then. This podcast is brought to you by Straight A Nursing. 